Las Vegas, Nevada, the entertainment capital of the world. Over the next three days, the top 32 Magic Pro League players and 36 challengers will attempt to forge their path to victory. $750,000 is up for the taking. And so is a seat at the Magic the Gathering World Championship. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for day three, the final day of Mythic Championship number three. And what a weekend it has been, starting with 68 players, going all the way down to four. Three of them, gods of the game, one of them, a newcomer. Who will win today? It's time to find out. The winner will get $100,000, this trophy, and most importantly, an invite to the World Championship at the end of the year. Since the matches are gonna get kicked off in a few minutes, let's find out what happened yesterday and see how these players made it to the top four. Top 16 action coming at you today. Really exciting stuff. There's a lot of pressure on Kai Buda to get the pressure on early and started otherwise. We need to see hand oh, approach, and command there's the tread Command the Dreadhorde off the top of the library for Kai Buda. It usually comes down to like one player drawing one more big spell. <gasps> oh, is there, oh my goodness, the Elder spell. spell off the top. He can he can emblem the Teferi now. That's huge. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty good feeling when you like think, maybe I'm going to win. I'm pretty likely to win, and then you draw the counter spell, and you're like, all right, not, now I'm winning. This is, this is it. I'm going to win. Shota says good game, and Kai Buda earns the victory. Somebody, though, who is very, very excited to get potentially one more win under his belt and lock up a spot, fingers crossed, in the top four is Shahar Shenhar. I have to win one more round since now I'm 2-0, so if I win next round, then I'm in the top four. This board is just insane. And now Jenny Manuel has to try to beat this and he drew a spell pierce? I just thought it would be awesome uh, to show some enthusiasm when I win this game. So I want to put some sunglasses on. It worked for Ralph Levy. Look at those shades. He looks rather dashing, doesn't he? I like that. Playing mono red here this weekend has served him very, very well, and it's gotten him through to the top four. Mateus Leverado! But much like for LeBron James in basketball, I don't bet against Brad Nelson in standard. I wouldn't be shocked if he won this match, man. Well, it's time to find out who will be advancing into top four. Let's get into the match. Leverado with a bumpy game oh, three. This has been a tough one. Here's Thought Erasure now from Brad Nelson, who may be on the verge of cruising into the top four. Every one of my opponents has, was here already, so it was such a weird feeling for me to like just be like shaking off you know, the, the day one jitters today. And it once he the does, the game is going to end. I don't know how I'm doing it. I don't know why my quote unquote good matchup was my hardest matchup of the day, but uh, I'm here and I finally get to play on Sunday stage. It's been quite a few years. Hello and welcome to coverage of the top four here at Mythic Championship number three. We started with 68, but of course there can be only one. Hello and welcome to the news desk. I'm Ray Bartholdi. That's day nine. That's Cedric Phillips. How are you guys feeling this morning? I'm super pumped. This is such great storylines. <laughs> oh my gosh, right? Like Shahar Shanhar, who left the building because he thought he didn't make it, had to get called back now in top four. You have Brad Nelson, who just wins. Just, just keeps wins. winning. Yep. He is the man to beat. And then you have Kai Buda, who did the miracle run in lowers. And Matias Leverado, let's not forget, qualified against thousands of people in the Magic the Gathering Arena online qualifiers. And now is in top four. At incredible stories. All right, let's take a look at our bracket to find out who is playing who this morning at Mythic Championship number three. Some fantastic matchups due to the fact that we've got a fantastic top four here. Shahar Shenhar will kick things off versus Matias Leverado. And then we're going to get to see a chance of the greats of the game, Brad Nelson versus Kai Buda. A rematch, if it were. These players have played against each other way back when in 2010 in Pro Tour Amsterdam, a match I actually was in person to watch. It was a back and forth Fair. It was fun watching Brad play against one of the legends of the game that he always looked up to, and now they're going to get to do it again. It should be a lot of fun. And I believe they both have identical deck lists, so it's going oh, to be yeah. Esper Hero, who wore it better. <laughs> we'll see. We will see. Brad, of course, a standard juggernaut, but Kai is the German juggernaut. 
All right, here's a look at our first matchup we'll be watching this morning. Shahar Shenhar on Mono Red versus Matias Leverado on Simic Nexus. And you know, I would typically say that most matches in Match of the Gathering are a little favored to one or quite even. This is a rough match for Matias Leverado. It's going to be an uphill Agro. battle. Yeah, I He's feel like we've been saying that all weekend, though, about his matchups. And That's yet, true. Here he is into the top four. So <laughs> yeah, right. maybe he can do it again. Who knows? I mean, honestly, the fact that Matias Leverado was able to get into the top four by beating an aggressive white weenie deck is just incredible. And here's our second matchup we'll be taking a look at this morning. Brad Nelson on Esper Hero versus Kai Buddha on Esper Hero. Uh, return a blast from the past here from 2010, Cedric. You said it. Meeting again here in the top finish. And Sean, you mentioned it. It is a mere match. Brad Nelson, Brian Brondewin, and of course Kai Buddha, they work together on the exact same deck. They're playing the exact same 75. Kai was able to dispatch, dispatch Brian, who actually did a lot of the legwork on the deck. Is he going to be able to beat Brad too? That should be a lot of fun to find and out. You know what is so funny? Kai, of course, one of the greatest players to ever play the game, looked very nervous yesterday when s with, with the possibility of facing Brad yeah. here on, uh, on this Sunday stage. Well, let's take a deeper look at Shahar Shenhar, get to know him a little bit better. Shahar Shenhar, of course, your two-time world champion, started playing Magic in 2007. 32 Mythic Championships played for him there. Uh, just an excellent all-around player, but he's one of the few players who's so good who's never locked up a top finish at an event in a top eight for a Pro Tour. Yeah, which is kind of crazy to think about. I remember the first time I met Shahar, as you see his mono-red deck list that he's playing here this weekend, some pretty stock stuff, but it was a Grand Prix in San Diego. I was playing some pickup games before the sealed round started and I was playing against this young kid and he kept critiquing my play and I'm like hey who the heck are you man I know how to do this I don't need your help uh, guess who won that Grand Prix by the way it was not me it was him it was nice. him well let's take a look at his winning in match from yesterday and how he got here to the top four I mean a lot of people just love to say that mono red aggro oh yeah this is just a deck you want to play when you want to ladder up quickly play fast easy games but I mean Shahar Shanhar is employing a really unusual construction of mono red. Having 20 mountains, many decks are down to 19, 18, trying to be ultra fast, but Shahar main decks four copies of Experimental Frenzy, four copies of Light Up the Stage, and two copies of Chandra. And in this way, Shahar Shanhar is much greedier, much more like mid-range burn red kind of deck. The nice thing about his build of this deck is he can play a little bit of a longer game, but still has the ability to play a very short game. And that's what Mono Red does like to do. If the game does draw out, he's always got the safety valve of drawing into Chandra or Experimental Frenzy. And in this matchup against Jean Emmanuel Dupra, when he was playing for top four today, things went very well for him in both stages of the game. He won a very quick early game in game number two. In this first game, as you see here, Experimental Frenzy took things away and Jean Emmanuel was not able to catch up. We take a look at the second game now with Runaway Steamkin and Legion Warboss. Yeah, this is the kind of game that really highlights just how fast this deck can be. I mean, not only huge amount of damage very early on in the game, but that good old four power, four toughness Steamkin starts turning into a light up the stage, starts turning into a larger Steamkin, starts turning into more spells, starts turning into duplicate Steamkins, and is it Phoenix? Not a lot of sweeping potential there. No, no sweepers in the deck. And again, this is going to highlight the power of red. You can see in Shahar's hand in this particular game as he builds this massive battlefield thanks to Runaway Steam. Can there's still an experimental frenzy in hand? So if this game were to continue, Shahar would probably have the advantage there as well. That's what made Mono Red the best deck in the early stages of the <laughs> format. Players stepped away from it, and sometimes <laughs> players put on shades when they're winning. I I love just the subtle cues in these builds that Shahar Shenhar is employing, where. So many long-term cards. Dire Fleet Daredevils mm -hmm. for extra value. Legion War Boss in case the opponent's opening is a little slow. Still keeping all the Planeswalkers Experimental Frenzy's card draw. I really think that it's this sort of creativity in the build that brought Shahar so far. And I mean, Mono Red has been a deck for a long time. It's gone kind of in and out of favor, ebbed and flowed. But Shahar showing us here that, guess what? It's still great. Oh, it's so good. Oof. All right, let's take a look at Matias Leverado, his opponent here in our top four. There he is, started playing Magic in 1999. Much fewer Mythic Championships played for Matias, uh, but he is, of course, the underdog story of the tournament, your Arena MCQ winner, fighting through thousands of people on Arena to secure his spot here. But underdog as well is his deck. And I can't believe favorite standard card, Nexus of Fate, like favorite pastime activity, <laughs> stealing candy from babies. <laughs> Matias Leverado employing the Nexus of Fate Wilderness Reclamation combo that is just so potent when you get there. There is not a lot of early game defense in this deck. It is essentially a blink of an eye. 
four root snares, and uh, that's about it. That's yeah. about what you got. There's not a ton of early game defense for him at all, but sometimes in some matchups, there is simply just enough. And this deck just has such power and combo potential very quickly. In a matchup like this that he played, playing for top four against Lee CTN, you know, this was classified to be a pretty bad match. If you see all these creatures attacking, but a timely Root Snare, and then going off with Wilderness Reclamation and Nexus of Fate, the key cards from the deck, was able to cement his advantage in game number one. And once this deck gets going, Sean, there's almost no stopping him. Yeah, it, it, it's what makes it a very odd deck to look at, because you intend to lose a ton of health, and then eventually wind up in this position where Li Xitian just said, all right, do I give up after four turns in a row? After five turns in a row? You know what? Let's just go on to game two. And then it, it went pretty much as you'd expect a white versus Simic deck to go. Some very cute blocks coming up from Matias Leverado. And I think this shows the cleverness of the sideboarding plan relying on biogenic oozes. A lot more creatures, a lot more sturdy units out on the field, but it was a single Sky Marcher Aspirant that allowed Li Shi Tian to tie the series up. But this third game, which I had the pleasure of covering alongside Alias V, it was quite the doozy. It was just not a very good draw here for Li Shi Tian. And fortunately here for Matias, it took him a little while to get off of the ground, but once he did, his deck did exactly what it always does, which starts using and transforming Searcher's content into his content, The Sunken Ruin, finding a copy of Wilderness Reclamation. You can already see the key card, his favorite card, not many people's favorite, but it would be mine if I was doing this well in Nexus of Fate. He starts going nuts, and he moved on to the top four. It was a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, I, I really can't stress enough how Matias Leverado is being so precise with when he is chump blocking, when he is trying to favor trades. Matias Leverado does a brilliant job maximizing the possibility of getting to that infinite turn sequence, which, although it's very frustrating to play against, it's incredibly difficult to perform consistently, and that really is what I think is bringing Matias Leverado so much success at this tournament. Every single time we say he's an underdog, he does great. He wins. Yeah, he keeps winning. Really only had, I, just really that match against Brad Nelson that went a little poorly. Everything else looked great for him mm -hmm. all weekend long. All right, well, I'm going to put you two guys on the spot for picking a winner of this match. Who do you like day nine? For this match? Oh, I mean, I got to go with Shahar Shandar with the bottom <laughs> red. I mean, like, I, I am going to only do safe, easy picks here, okay? I am not going to okay. be that guy. Oh, I think that Sim McNess is going to pull it off. Listen, I did Brad Nelson on day one because all he did was win, and he kept winning. Whew! And I just got to make sure I look uh, like a smart caster. So I'm just going to say mono red. Put me on the spot here, too. I'm going to use the number two very quickly before I make my prediction. For Shahar Shedhar, he's a back-to-back -back world champion. He's won two of them. This is Matias Leverado's second Mythic Championship. That's kind of crazy to think of with That's regards true. to just how big of an underdog he is. But guess what? Every time we've picked against him, he's won. Give me the underdog. Give me the guy in his second Mythic Championship beating a two-time world champion. Matias Leverado, draw Nexus of Fate. Do your thing for the people at home. And you know what the cool thing is, too? If Shahar wins, you know, he's got that world championship to set his sights on because that's what you get if you win this tournament. Mm -hmm. And he could be setting himself up for his third world championship win, potentially. That's absolutely insane. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible how decorated the players are in the top four with the stark contrast <laughs> yeah. against Matias Leverado. I mean, just looking at these sheets, it's like Mythic Championships, 60. Yeah. How many games played? Thousands. But how many world championship wins? More than one. I mean, it's this kind of caliber of play that makes the top four so exciting. And this next match is coming up between Shahar Shenhar and Matias Leverado. We got the chance to talk to the players about their thoughts before the game. Matias, that is my actual best matchup. Please let me play against Nexus. My name is Shahar Shenhar. I am from Israel, but I actually live in Vegas. I am Matias Liberato. I come from Argentina, Buenos Aires. Mono Red is the match that I don't want to face. I've been dodging it for the most part of the tournament. I think it's fair enough to, to play him now. I think I'm highly favored in that matchup. It's magic, anything can happen, so we have to wait and see. The trophy is so close within my reach. The chances are there. I will try to go to win it all. Friends at home, I'm Becca Scott, and I am so very pleased to introduce these players to the stage right now. Coming up first, we have back-to-back -back world champion in 2013 and 2014. Let's see if the shades come out in this match. It's Shahar Shinhar! And the underdog from Argentina, a top 
Elevated National 2010 and the Magic uh, World, Cup, World Team Cup 2012. Let's see what the nexus of his fate is. It's Matias Leverato. And let's head on over to Marshall and Paul in the booth. Thank you, Becca, and welcome back to coverage here of the Championship 3. Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Chiana. It is our great pleasure to bring you coverage of the top four. Of course, we've been kind of ratcheting up the excitement, the drama, and the stakes every single day as we've gone through this three-day event, but this is where it's all on the line. We're going to be playing a double elimination top four bracket today. And at the end of the day, we're going to give away that trophy, $100,000 first prize. Let's not forget that. And of course, that invite to the World Championship at the end of the season. Yeah, but keep in mind, this is a double elimination tournament, basically, for the top four players. So, you know, we're going to be starting out with the first few rounds. Even if you lose these few rounds, the first couple of rounds, you're still in it. Yeah, obviously a ton on the line for these players, but let's just let's just ease our way in, Paul. Right? It's going to be a long day. We don't we don't need to be in a rush. Now, everybody, by the way, here in the tournament floor, backstage, the players uh, at the analyst desk is saying that Leverado is just not in a good position here against Shahar Shenhar. How bad is this matchup really? I think if you talk about the worst possible matchup, like the, the, the greatest difference in matchup per win percentage, this might be it. Like, so if, 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 if I gave you all the decks in the field and I said, create the biggest delta, <laughs> this would be the one. Absolutely. Oh, this is the, the mono red aggressive deck. The thing is, what the Simic Nexus deck is looking to do is ramp up, of course, cast Wilderness Reclamation and start chaining Nexus Fates together. And its primary form of defense against aggressive strategies is the card Root Snare. However, what the Mono Red deck is, try is trying to do is, yeah, deal some points of damage early on, in the, uh, early on, but then in the late game, it has access to the Burn Spells to kind of finish off your opponents, and Root Snare is not going to save you against that. Seems rough if you're sitting in Leverado's seat. Let's see if he can pull off a miracle and defeat Shahar Shenhar. First things first, though, Shahar's on the board with Gitu Lava Runner. Shahar is on the draw this game. No plays yet from <coughs> Leverado outside of an opt, and it looks like he's got another opt at the ready here. But this is the one-two punch. He's got the runaway steam kit here on turn number two. Yeah, the upside is Leverato was able to win the die roll, so he's on the play, which gives him a much better shot of trying to pull this game out, but things are going to be very, very tough for him. Shahar with one drop, two drop, and uh, he's probably going to be looking to attack here and then cast light up the stage. I think the one thing Shahar is considering here is maybe casting an additional reds, one of his one drops, either a Lava Runner or a Shock, just to put that additional counter onto the Steamkin to get in for more damage. Every single bit of damage matters. That lets him light up the stage right away, which gets another counter on the Steamkin. And it also even pumps up the Gitu Lava Runner. And right. had Shahar found a mountain up the light up the stage, he would have been able to play the other Lava Runner in hand and get in for 10? Wow. No, sorry, 8. <laughs> so yeah, that was actually a pretty important pre-combat sequence there. And it went fairly well for Shahar, though not perfectly, as he did not find a mountain. And in fact, he found a Shock and a Viachino Pyromancer. So he's going to get two damage one way or the other, though it looks like he's lining up Gitu Lava Runner number two. He's already got Leverado down to 12 life. This is this is a lethal attack. So Shahar just needs <laughs> to play serious? Gitu Lava Runner. <laughs> runaway Steamkin goes up to four. That's an attack for eight. Then he can use the three mana from the Runaway Steamkin to cast the Viachino Pyromancer and Shock. <laughs> <laughs> so Leverato here has to, I mean, he sees that already. So Leverato just needs to use the blast zone that he hasn't played to get those two Gitu Lava Runners off the battlefield. So Shahar Shenhar forcing the issue early. And if you're just joining us, don't go anywhere. This one could be quick. Shahar's going to run out Steamkin number two. I think he sees the blast zone as well and says, well, if, he's, if I'm going to force him to do that anyway, I may as well just go off here. And that's exactly what's happening. There's the Viachino Pyrancer, knock you down to 10. But, you know, this does mean Leverado has one turn to try to go off here. He does have a second Wilderness Reclamation in hand. So next turn, he can play land, Wilderness Reclamation, and then cast Nexus of Fate. Wow, okay. So now, this is it. He needs to kind of go off this turn. Now, the problem is, of course, and, and we've talked about this through the course of the event, is that he does need some type of advantage going to make continued strings of Nexus of Fate 
good, right? It, simply casting it over and over again doesn't actually get him anywhere. Does he have that in sight here? He does have Tamiyo Collector of Tales okay. in hand, and he's got a Chemist's Insight in the graveyard. So okay. I actually think he's live here. There is a lot of potential for him to actually win this game. Wow, he's down to three life, and he cannot pass the turn back to Shahar in most realistic scenarios. Now, Root Snare actually does keep him at bay here, as Shahar does not have any burn spells in his hand. Yeah, but Matthias has not only Tamiyo, he also has Narset, Parter, Veils. Both of those cards are able to dig four cards deep to try to find Nexus of Fate. Uh, that means he gets eight looks <laughs> for Nexus of Fate on top of his deck. Is Leverado going to steal game number one here? It's, it's very possible here. Oh, he found a Nexus of Fate. Narset, Parter, Veils hits the battlefield and finds Nexus of Fate. Also, by the way, Memorial to Genius, if we're talking about the card draw, he could really start seeing a lot of cards here. Uh, is this one slipping away from Shahar in his best match? Oh, and he hit another Nexus of Fate. So now Leverato has two Nexus of Fates in hand. And I think it's going to be really difficult at this point for Leverato to actually whiff. I mean, he's got additional turns, additional looks with Narset Parter Veils along with Tamiyo. So now he's just banked two additional turns. Thanks to those two <laughs> copies of Will and he yeah. top decked one. There's a root snare in his yard. Let's see. Oh my goodness. How many? And he, he hit another he one. He has like three turns in the bank at this point. Yeah, he does. And he can do another one as well. And you can see the pace of play hastening for, for Leverado. He's like, all right, I think I got this. I mean, if you see on the left side of the screen, all those Nexus of Fate turns on the stack, and he keeps hitting with these Tamios and the Narsets on Nexus of Fate. There's another one. They're just piling up. Again, he's run out of room. <laughs> yeah, there's that, that little part arrow. Of the screen. It's like scroll down to see all the turns. Oh and here's goodness. another one. That's like four extra turns in the bank. And with these Planeswalkers active, he can keep finding more. Yeah, and Tamiyo's going to continue looking for Nexus of Fates. Leverado now can you know, try to find also search for Escanta to just have additional looks with those Wilderness Reclamations in play. But he's got it all. And there he's, it got a, he's got a Nissa here to try to close out the game. That seems like it's game, right? Nissa, who shakes the world now, is going to add attacker after attacker after attacker to the battlefield and simply overwhelm Shahar over the course of the next Five turns, yeah. which are all Leverados. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems ext it's extremely unlikely at this point Incredible. for, for, for Leverado lo to lose. I believe he has four turns on the stack here with Nexus of Fate. And this, by the way, highlights the importance of play draw in a matchup like this. If Shahar was on the play, it looks like he would have won this game quite easily. Ab absolutely. And he wasn't. And Leverado is able to combo off here. Now he's found a blast zone as well. And he can he can set blast zone on two and pop it to kill all the two drops on the battlefield so that Leverado can actually get an attacks in with the animated lands. That's right. And now this adds up very quickly because it's not three plus three plus three. It's three plus six plus nine. It adds up very fast. And all of a sudden, the game's going to end. Matthias Leverado going off in game one and stealing a game from Shahar Shenhar. This is quite a turn of events in our first game of the day. This is this is this is huge. I mean, he he had he had to he absolutely had to find one more Nexus of Fate, and he was able to. I mean, he got enough looks. He did get the draw where Shahar wasn't able to finish him off. He got that second Wilderness Reclamation down, and you get to see the power of that card. I mean, it just gives you so much mana. You can see that Leverado is still going through the motions, but again, he's got two more turns in the bank thanks to that flurry of Nexus of Fate where he was casting multiple copies of it per turn in multiple turns. Now oh. we're moving to the second to the last, but that's it. Nexus of Fate off the top of the library plus another 3-3 three, three is 9 damage plus a turn and another turn. It's easily enough damage. Again, Nissa who shakes the world getting the job done and Shahar is now down a game and he's got to win back to back. Now, again, we should mention we're in double elimination. Everybody take a deep breath. But I'll tell you what, <laughs> against the particular top four that we have here, losing a match is a major blow. It puts you in an extremely difficult situation. 
and uh, neither player here is interested in that. And it looks like Shahar is not interested in those in kind of getting to the late game, as we know that the Simic Nexus deck, Simic Nexus deck is the ultimate late game deck. So instead, he's choosing to shave on some of those four mana card draw effects like Frenzy, and just choosing to add whatever cards in the sideboard that put on early pressure in this matchup. Now, what about for Leverado? So it doesn't look like he's got, you know, some versions have Thorn Lieutenant in the sideboard. He doesn't have anything like that. But it does look like he's trying to ramp. He does have the four copies of Paradise Druid that he sideboarded it in. And I'm, not, I'm not exactly, you know, it's a little bit questionable there. I'm not sure you want it because um, Shahar does play Goblin Chain Whirler. Oof. So that, that is kind of a bit of a blowout if you get that going. But I think Leverado understanding that this matchup is quite poor and, you know, his path to victory here is just hoping his opponent doesn't have it, and using that mana from the Paradise Druid to kind of turbo out a Biogenic Ooze or get that Wilderness Reclamation in play as quickly as possible. Yeah, it doesn't have a lot of great options. So he's going to have to work with the ones that he's got. Solid opener here from Shahar. One drop into a Firebrand, light up the stage. Curious if he actually goes for it here, because next turn you know he's going to go ahead and play the War Boss. Looks like he is. Oh, hey, well, I guess he's going to right. play the War Boss anyways. <laughs> yeah. Nothing like multiple War Bosses. Now again, Shahar on the play, as you mentioned, could be super important here. Wow, wow, triple War Boss opener. This is going to add on a lot of damage very quickly, and Leverado's deck is certainly not suited to take care of a problem like this. Yeah, I mean, Leverado's in a lot of trouble this game. Right. He needs to draw Wilderness Reclamation here or something to, to really have a chance here. This is just way too much pressure. I mean, next turn, Shahar's going to be able to deploy another Legion War Boss if he wants. That's right. And the Simic Nexus deck simply just does not have a way to get War Boss off the table. Yeah, and you see the Paradise Druid trading off for the Lava Runner to save a damage here is basically the death knell. It means that Leverado has no options this turn on anything super powerful. His best play is going to be to play a Replacement Druid plus Opt. There's a Wizard's Lightning off the top of the library as well. But it looks like it's just another Legion War Boss. And I am curious if the original War Boss is going to get into the red zone too. Is that a trade oh, yeah. that Shahar's fine with? Oh, well, yeah, Shahar's, right Shahar's attacking with everything yeah, for right. sure. Send him in. Right, of course. He also gets the. Uh, the mentor trigger there, which is important. Yeah, mentor trigger is huge, and you know, you know what? He's he's happy if if Leverado trades off the Paradise Druid here. That means that there's going to be no Biogenic Ooze coming down next turn, and you do want to slow down the mana, and you just have more Legion War Bosses in the bank. You know, this is not this Simic Nexus deck is not a deck that can put a ton of blockers onto the battlefield. So, you know, he's kind of happy with getting that Paradise Druid off the board. Here's an opt, but this looks like this is it. The, the last uh, breath here for Leverado in game number two, because this one with the land is uh, exactly how Shahar drew it up. I think we're done here. Yeah, this is nine damage on the board, and then we also see Wizard's Lightning and Lightning Strike. So yeah, so I think it's it's probably just best for Shahar to just not even play this war boss necessarily, and just choose to attack with everything and uh, finish off Leverato with the burn spells. No root snare. Maybe even wait till the upkeep. Or not. How about right now? I guess given that he has lightning strike and wizard's lightning, it doesn't matter. He even if he has the gate. Yeah. Right. So there you go. That is game number two going to Shahar Shenhar. He says, not so easy, my friend. You may have stolen game number one. This matchup still favors me greatly. Now, the third game, of course, will feature Leverado once again <clears throat> on the play. That said, if he has a draw like that, it won't matter. Right, right. Yeah, Leverado, I mean, being on the plays is crucial, but also Leverado needs to get, you know, kind of the top 10 or 15% of his draws to really have a chance in this matchup, I think. Um, again, being on the play helps out a lot. 
He's got some cards here to pad his life total. Bond of Flourishing is a nice, nice piece of tech here that he has access to. You know, helps him find cards like Wilderness Reclamation or Biogenic Ooze, giving you some life. It does basically just counteract the burn spell from the mono red deck. All right, we are underway here. It's time for game number three in our opening match of the top four here at Mythic Championship 3. Good Sunday morning to you. If you happen to be local, otherwise, good morning. That is Oof. not a keepable That's hand. That's not the hand, is it? Shahar needs to have creatures early to have oh, a chance. No. Oh. oh, no. He's going to five here. Shahar Shenhar okay. has found a keeper here. This one looks pretty good. I don't think he wants that war boss. Now, what about for Leverado? What does he have going on up there? Opt, Bond of Flourishing, Ooh, His hand is spiral. fantastic. Oh, my goodness. He has Growth Spiral. He has Growth Spiral, which is huge. And then he's got Bond of Flourishing. Biogenic who's oh and look at this he even finds island here so we can grow spiral into island wow. into opt this is a huge light up the stage incoming here for shahar oh. he needs to find some land absolutely he really needs to hit mountains off of this okay he hit one mountain off of it he'll be relieved to see that now he doesn't get to actually do anything this turn other than pass the turn leverado fires off growth spiral gets that land onto the battlefield and that of course allows him to cast opt as well you see that Biogenic Ooze looming. That is the type of card that if he can turbo it onto the battlefield, as you put it, Paul, he can actually dominate the ground game. Yeah, things are looking really good here for Leverado. Let's see what he chooses to do here. He even has that Bond of Flourishing to pad his life total. Back then he up can, to 21. Then he can run out that Biogenic Ooze. Um, might not want to run out Paradise Druid here. He does have just a Gross Barrel in hand anyways. So do that to play around potential Goblin Chain Whirler. That makes sense. He has the land in his hand already, so he's guaranteed to generate okay. an extra advantage. Well, he didn't do it. There's Experimental Frenzy, Ooh, and though. no land. That's not what Shahar wants to see at all. And, and I mean, <laughs> this is kind of another way to win, I guess. This is kind of plan, plan C, if you will. Just hope your opponents get kind of slower draws. I mean, Leverado had a fantastic draw. He did have the Gross Spiral, he, you know, and he's kind of found all the pieces. He drew a sideboard, Bond of Flourishing. And wow. And at this point, he just wants Shahar to tap out, so he can that opens the door for him to play Biogenic Ooze and then and, and, you know have plus one plus one counters on you know both the Ooze and the other creature. Yeah, the Lightning Strike should be able to stem the bleeding there. However, uh, this one could get very interesting as right now Leverado is kind of just has the Ooze. He has some hope though. There's Gross Spiral. There's uh, Memorial to Genius, but right now it, it's Ooze or bust, and he's going to lose the Ooze here. Yeah, and Shahar has to kill the ooze here. And but that's it. I mean still that's no pressure. Yeah. Leverado is sitting at twenty one. But Shahar has some late game cards in hand. He's got that Steamkin that can that provide him some mana. He's got that experimental frenzy. And Leverado does need to find, you know, a threat, a way to get ahead on cards. Chemistry's inside search for Askenta, any one of those cards. But it looks like he's just gonna sit back for now and crack the memorial to genius seems to be the game plan for him. Yeah, it looks like, yeah, that's what he's going to do here. Shahar now has the option of either running out Steamkin or Pyromancer. I think Steamkin makes a little more sense here. He can play the Steamkin this turn and have them start put, uh, you know, growing off the other red spells in hand. Next turn, he can run out the Pyromancer. The Steamkin on the right, the 3-3, will become a 4-4, which will then give Shahar access to 3 mana to cast whatever he wants. If he draws a land, he can play Goblin Chain Whirler plus Wizard's Lightning because the Pyromancer is a wizard. That's right, and of course, this is the stage of the game now where Shahar's changing gears, right? We're not in that all-in red, attack you every every turn like we did last game. Now he's starting to say, okay, I've got to build up a force with these two runaway Steamkins and try to have some explosive turns in the next upcoming turns rather than then. Ooh, and this is big, yeah, last zone last for zone two. Though, to clear out the way. Uh, again, that was one of the options that Leverado had in addition to the Memorial Shahar Genius. needs Mountain. And oh. there it is. It's a mountain off the okay. top of the library, and that's going to stabilize this board once again for Shahar. We've got a game on our hands. Yeah, absolutely. Chemistry's oh. Insight was a nice draw, though, for Leverado. That could help him find the action he needs to press his advantage. He also can cast Paradise Druid this turn. Yeah, crucial attack here. I actually thought he might he might have just looked to fire off Chemistry's Insight. Leverado has multiple Memorial to Geniuses in his in his deck, so if you do draw that off the inside, you might want to run it out. Although, sure. he, he's got the one in play. I don't know how many more he has in his deck, but... I think three is kind of standard, and it looks like he has three. 
But yeah, this Chemistry's Insight was a tremendous draw, and this is, you know, oftentimes Chemistry's Insight allow you to find additional Chemistry's Insight, and they just start chaining together. That's right. You end up betting four cards off of it. Now, he does find okay. Wilderness Reclamation here, and with that Chemistry's Insight in his graveyard, ready to be jump-started, we could see him start really churning through his library, and it is very much on Shahar Shenhar at this point to apply maximum pressure as quickly as possible because every turn that goes by is Leverado setting up closer and closer to starting to be able to go off. Yeah, Leverado's looking really good now. I mean, he's has, he has the ability to basically draw four cards here. He's got the Chemistry's Insight, he's gonna pitch that for us, and he can sacrifice the Memorial to Genius for two additional cards. So, you know, drawing four cards, he's extremely likely to find more ways to kind of get ahead here. Okay, he found Blink of an Eye and Wilderness Reclamation. Still, still not the exact things he needs, but again, it's more progress towards those things. Blink of an Eye gets him a card and can help uh, stymie Shahar's plans. Shahar's going to finally fire off this Wizard's Lightning on end step to take care of the 3-3 three, three Ooze. He's looking to clear the attacks for this Vyashino Pyromancer as well. Is, Le is Leverado going to pull off the Miracle against Shenhar here? Yeah, I mean, I think he needed a lot of things to go right, but they all did. I mean, the stars kind of aligned, you know, Shahar mulliganing down to five, having kind of an anemic start, not a lot of pressure, and uh, and Leverado with a very strong draw. And even even despite all of that, it looked like Shahar had somewhat of a chance. I mean, he's not dead yet, but Leverado's looking really good here. And you, you mentioned he needed a 10 to 15, you know, the top 10 yeah. or 15. Well, he did. Right. And then Shahar mulligan to five. Right. And he won game one. I mean, this has been a very steep hill to climb here and, for Matthias Leverado. And before that chemistry's inside, it just looked like an even game. Yeah. But never give up because there is experimental frenzy on the battlefield now for Shahar, who finds a mountain on top of the library. Are we going to see that sent back to hand here? We oh, are. Yeah. Blink of an eye is going to send it packing. Experimental Frenzy is vulnerable to these type of effects where you spend an entire turn to get it on the battlefield. And if you don't go off and you have to do that again, you can simply fall too far behind. And Leverado's now going through his library. Here's an opt into another opt. And there's a Nexus of Fate. And he's got Tick all the talk. mana in the world. He will have two copies of Wilderness Reclamation, effectively tripling his mana capacity when it comes to instants. <laughs> and the Paradise Druid is getting in the red zone. Shahar's like, wait, what's going on? All right, I'm going to block. And there's that second copy of Wilderness Reclamation. Now we're going to go to end step, trigger, trigger, untap the lands, play Nexus of Fate, probably crack one of those Memorial to Genius with the other trigger. And this is where things can get really out of hand. Leverado just needs something to get through okay, his library. He, he needs a card draw spell or a planeswalker. Ooh, okay. okay so, so now there's a one turn window. Search for his Kanta is exactly what he needed, assuming that he can transform it. Because then he can start activating it multiple times per turn, and we know how that goes. But it's not transformed right now. And Liberato can still find Nexus of Fate here. And the correct thing to do here is just tapping all your mana. You don't want to, you might not want to necessarily. Oh, okay, looks like he, given he has so much mana, it doesn't really matter. He floated it, but he missed again. Okay. Land, land off the top of the library, but what can Shahar do? I'm under the assumption here that that search for his cant is going to transform. Shahar right. can't kill him this turn. Yeah, not in time. I mean, he needs Leverato to whiff hard. Really, really, like, unrealistically hard at this point. Right. But <laughs> Matias Leverato, I cannot believe he is on the verge of stealing this first match from Shahar Shenhar. Yeah, now we're going to get four Ascanta the Sunken Ruin triggers. <laughs> Leverado is going to be able to look at 16 cards here to find a <laughs> Nexus of Fate. So I think he's a favorite. You like his chances, do you? Yeah, well, yeah. Just, there just it a is. little bit. Just a little There's bit. one. You see all those triggers. I mean, he's got a Nexus of Fate in his hand now, so... It seems that Shahar will not get another turn. 
for the rest of the match. Oh, that, I don't think so. I mean, th this is pretty much going to be it. There's Callus' dismissal as well for Leverado, and he's just going through the motions at this point. And by the way, I've been impressed by him all tournament. He is extremely comfortable just burning through. You know, this is yeah. a little bit finicky, like a tapping, untapping, floating, using your mana. He just goes right through I mean, it. he's had a ton of success with this deck. He knows yeah. this deck inside and out. He is like a true master with this. So I expect nothing less at this point. I mean, he's, I mean, look at the field that he's had to fight through to get to this point. I mean, MPL players left and right, winning matchups that he wasn't supposed <laughs> to, and he's going to do it again here. It's incredible. Now he's just churning through once again, and there's Nexus of Fate again, plus he took Tamiyo last time. By the way, this is all on his end step, so that's finally going to use one of the two turns that he had in the bank. He's going to play Tamiyo Collector of Tales, plus it, name Nexus of Fate, and let's see what he hits. There's one right there. One. Good enough. He still has another turn in the bank, by the way. And let's not forget, these has canted the Sunken Ruins are getting activated. Not one, not two, not three, up to four times per turn. And that means that Matthias Leverado is going to defeat Shahar Shenhar. There is no way out at this point for Absolutely Shahar. Not. He just Shahar, has to sit here and watch. Shahar is basically just dead, and we're now kind of going through the motions. At some point, Leverado is going to feel comfortable enough where he has enough turns left in the bank. And he can actually just finish off the game with that mobilized district that he has in play. Yes. And Shahar says, good games, indicating a concession is incoming. And the underdog is through, picks up that first match win. And it was against easily his worst matchup. Oh, yeah. I am super impressed. And as he said, by the way, he had a little, he had some words there when we were at the analyst desk, and he said, it's magic, anything can happen. Boy, was he right about that. Yeah, absolutely. And he was saying, you know, the matchup that I don't want to play is against Mono Red. That's my absolute worst matchup. But you know what? I'm in the top four, so I guess it's okay to play it in the top four, you know? Yeah. And you know, now I'm qualified for the next event. Everything's fine. But, you know, at the same time, you know, great draws from him. And, you know, subpar drop from Shahar in that third game allowed him to actually pull out this victory. Yeah, and that's the thing is that it's really important to always remember here, in Magic, even a really bad matchup ends up being 70, 30 or right. something like that. 30% is a lot, that's you know? Still, that's, that still, happens that's still often. a good shot, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, you know, with standard, when we refer to something as a good matchup, I mean, it's like 55%, maybe 60 tops. This is one of those, I, I would say, most polarizing matchups. But even then, it's 70, 30. It's yeah. magic. Yeah. Anything can happen. And we saw that here. Yeah, that was absolutely incredible. And what a position for Matthias Leverado. He is now just cruising through this tournament. Now he's got another match to play before he makes it into the finals, but boy, what a great spot to be yeah, in. And, and this was the crucial match, right? Because now that he, he's won this matchup, he gets to play against an Esper deck in the next round, no matter what happens. Which is it, what he wanted. It, which is what he wanted. So he's in really, really good shape here to potentially make it to the finals. Yeah, this victory here in our first round has completely blown this bracket <laughs> apart. Everything's going to be different from now on. Becca is with Matthias right now. That's right. Thank you, Marshall. Matthias, that was incredible. What an incredible upset. That was your worst matchup. How are you feeling after winning that match oh pretty great uh, I knew that for me to win I have to win game one start I will probably lose game two uh, and I have an opportunity in three so that's what's happened so I'm pretty happy yeah well you should be now you're gonna face um, two different Esper decks if you stay in the upper bracket is this what was ideal you got the hard one out of the way first yeah like Esper me this also not that good either but I think it's a little bit better than Mono Red but Anything can happen, so I'm trying to stay focused and, and do my best. How do you stay focused? Because you look very cool and calm and collected up there. I'm not. <laughs> you hide it well. How did you get to this level of mastery with the Nexus of Fate deck, uh, or uh, the Simic Nexus deck? Because you, you just tap so quickly, as Paul was saying. It's really impressive. Like, I was, I've been playing the deck for a long time, and I really like the deck, so I don't know. It's, it's in me. Well, I can tell that you are very excited. We're very excited for you. You're going to stay in that upper bracket. Next up, we have the other upper bracket semifinals against Kai Buda and Brad Nelson. So stay tuned. We'll be right after a quick break.
I'm Christian Haug. I'm a player of the Magic Pro League. My brother had these fancy cards he had been given from a friend. And uh, I looked at these cards and uh, I was hooked pretty fast. When I heard about the Pro League, I couldn't really believe it at first, to be honest. My brother has always been there for me and uh, Magic was this one thing which kept us connected and he is the guy who drives me to the airports every time I have to fly to a tournament, you know. So yeah, I told him first and afterwards 